to testify today about the state of the market, uh, of the job market. I want to start by placing the record number of job openings in the context of a strengthening labor market and an increase in dynamism. Uh, businesses have continued to hire in large numbers, just uh, again this June surpassing expectation. And over the past six years, we've seen the longest, most persi persistent streak of job growth on record. All this growth is leading to more openings, and perhaps more importantly, it's also leading workers to quit their jobs. And you might think that doesn't sound like a good thing, but it's actually a great thing when workers feel confident enough to leave their jobs in order to seek out better opportunities. In fact, job changes are essential for workers to climb the ladder to better and higher paying opportunities. And uh, a return to a healthy level of churn is incredibly important, and frankly, we're not quite there yet. Um, one of the most profound challenges our labor market faces is lackluster wage growth, so I want to spend most of my time talking about that. Wages provide a clear market-based signal of demand for skills, and one of the clearest signals is the high wages of college-educated workers compared to those with less education. That's not to downplay other forms of training, but I think it's essential to start there by understanding that the earnings gap between college graduates and those without has grown steadily for decades, uh, and in the recent years has been at an all-time high. The benefits of a four-year degree are also seen in a substantially lower unemployment rates and higher labor force participation rates, even compared to people with a two-year degree. In addition, while there is concern about student loans, very clear research shows uh, that student loans that have had the biggest increase in student loan defaults are associated with the rise in the number of borrowers at for-profit schools and other two-year institutions associated with weak employment outcomes. These findings underscore the importance of funding successful community college programs that are clearly linked to employment outcomes. Um, one of the largest challenges the labor force faces in developing the skills of workers is ensuring that students from across the income spectrum have access to successfully and affordably complete a four-year degree, because that is where the strongest demand uh, is, clear, is still being seen. Um, in competitive markets, a skills shortage should lead businesses to pay higher wages. And yet researchers have consistently failed to find evidence of employers bidding up wages of workers in areas even when there's a big gap between the number of openings and the number of hires. And that represents a real puzzle. I think the biggest place we see this is in healthcare, uh, where there's a lot of openings, not a lot of hires, but the wages aren't uh, picking up. Many economists have pointed uh, to slowing productivity growth as one of the sources of uh, of slow wage growth, but it's important to recognize that even if we were to solve that problem, in recent decades there's been a disconnect between productivity growth and wage growth that we need to address. Um, ways that, you know, some of the things that we're seeing is a decline in unionization, reduced worker bargaining power, um, and reduced worker mobility, and an increase in businesses engaging in clear anti-competitive labor market policies, including forbidding the sharing of pay information and requiring non-compete clauses, policies that are designed to restrict the ability of workers to make those uh, changes that allow them to bid up their wages as they become more productive. Um, Congress should seek to make the labor market as fair as possible by penalizing businesses that engage in such anti-competitive practices. Additionally, policies like updated overtime regulations, robust minimum wage, enforcing workplace protections are all key areas that are important to raise wages. And let me be clear, the current pace of job growth is unsustainable unless more workers elect to join the labor force and without higher wages, that is very unlikely to happen. So uh, let me uh, conclude by saying that there is something else policymakers can do beyond training, which is to provide stronger infrastructure to support jobs. Today's workers, particularly lower wage workers, face challenges in getting to work without adequate public transportation, face challenges finding care for their children without adequate affordable child care, and too often lose their jobs or are forced to quit when they need time off to care for a sick family member or their own illness. Better infrastructure in the form of affordable child care, paid family leave, and better public transportation to support work would clearly help attract more men and women to the labor force. Research has shown clearly that policies would boost women's labor force participation. Additionally, recent research has shown that roughly half of the drop in male labor
labor force participation is due to men cycling in and out of the labor force. So making it easier for men and women to consistently hold on to a job will boost labor supply. Um, and let me simply end by taking a moment to note some cultural changes that are going on with our labor market, because I know this committee is particularly interested in that. Many of our declining sectors are in traditionally male occupations, while traditionally female or more gender mixed occupations are growing. These changes are going to require that we not only provide training for workers uh, to successfully enter new occupations, but that we might rethink how we provide that training and how we conceive those jobs so that uh, there's greater diversity for men and women to enter the jobs that are going to offer them the highest pay, regardless of their cultural connotations. Thank you.